Hello, my name is Bruce Eater, and I'd like to welcome you to this special edition of Val Luton's Cat People. For the next hour or so, we're going to take a tour through this most unusual film and the careers of its makers, Val Luton, the producer, and Jacques Turner, the director, and the lives and work of its players, Simone Simone, Kent Smith, Jane Randolph, Tom Conway, Alan Napier, Elizabeth Russell, and the rest of what became the Val Luton Stock Company. And we'll delve into the history of RKO during the little understood period in which the Luton films were created, and the men and events behind that history. Cat People was the first movie made by Val Luton, an author turned producer who had been working in Hollywood since the early 1930s. His literary background manifests itself in the opening frames of Cat People, with a quotation from a book by Dr. Lewis Judd, the fictitious psychiatrist played in the movie by Tom Conway. Yes, Val Luton's movies are the only Hollywood B pictures to come with their own footnotes. The literary citation reveals more about Luton than does the opening shot of the action. A black leopard, and as the camera pulls back, we see Irena Dubrovna standing before the cage, sketching the leopard. The citation shows the respect Luton held for the intelligence of moviegoers, as well as an aspect of his literary background. He was that rare breed of filmmaker, the writer-producer, who came to the producer's spot by way of the typewriter, rather than the world of finance and business. And he was that relatively overlooked phenomenon, the producer or tour, as opposed to the director or tour. Of course, there never was a Dr. Lewis Judd, or a book, The Anatomy of Atavism. This is a typical novelist device to create not only a life, but a history and a paper trail for his characters, even his secondary characters. But it is an element with which most Hollywood filmmakers would not have concerned themselves or permitted their writers to concern themselves. Our hero and heroine, Oliver Reed and Irina Dubrovna, played by Kent Smith and Simone Simone, have met. And we should say something about this scene. It is New York City, and we've just had a glimpse of the Central Park Zoo as recreated at RKO in the year 1942. For those of us living at the other end of the century, it all seems a somewhat more civil, if not civilized, place. Cat People wastes no time developing its characters, and we're learning a lot about Oliver and Irena in this first minute of their meeting. He is orderly, she is not. And we get a glimpse inside of her through the sketch, torn up and abandoned to the wind, which reveals more of her than Oliver knows at present, but only enough to tease us. This shot by happenstance anticipates the scene in An American in Paris in which a torn sketch reassembles itself in the wind on the ground before artist Gene Kelly and leads directly into the ballet sequence that is the heart of the movie. Val Luton, DeWitt Bodine, and Jacques Turner take a lot less time getting to the heart of Cat People. But then, Cat People is a B-movie and didn't have the luxury of time to get to its center. There is a huge amount of information packed into these early scenes. One of the key aspects of Cat People, and of all Val Luton's successful films, was that they didn't shoot their entire load in one sitting. Viewers in theaters, or later on television, enjoyed coming back to them because they could always find new details that they'd missed previously. A doubly good reason for owning them on video today. And here's a line of dialogue with unintended special meaning. I never cease to marvel at what lies behind the brownstone front. That shot and Kent Smith's expression of surprise have very different meanings today. Ollie's surprise was intended to refer to Irena's building, but modern viewers react to the presence of the staircase left over from the mansion set of Orson Welles's The Magnificent Ambersons. At a screening in New York in 1993, there was audible laughter at the line, clearly from people who recognized the staircase. It turns up again, by the way, two years later in Val Luton's The Seventh Victim. We're entering Irena's world, which looks, and as Ollie remarks, even smells different from anything in the outside world. Listen closely and you can hear Roy Webb's music shimmer. Nice. That's Lalage. Lalage? A perfume I use. I like it. Perhaps too well. Maybe I use too much of it. Living and from here, the art department 
cinematographer Nicholas Muzaraka, and editor Mark Robson start to have fun with the entire concept of cat people. We can't quite be sure what this object is, but on the big screen, it is clearly the second image of a cat impaled on a spear, the feline and the phallic, if you will, that we've seen in just three minutes incidental to Irena's presence. There are even cat images on the audio track. What's that? It's the lions in the zoo. One can hear them here often. Many people in this building complain. The roaring keeps them awake. And you don't mind it? No. To me, it's the way the sound of the sea is to others. Natural and soothing. I like it. Some nights, there is another sound. The panther. It screams like a woman. I don't like that. The mystical sexual implications of the dialogue and the decor seem unmistakable today. The objects with which she decorates her apartment are completely fetishistic, merging the feline and the phallic as objects of devotion and obsession. She seems to recognize this convergence within herself in describing the pleasure that the sound of the lions evokes within her and her dislike of the sounds of the black leopard, which to her is like the screams of a woman. Even the way that Irena treats the subject of cats is revealing. She's embarrassed to show her interest in cats, which, as we learn, is tied to her sexuality. She even hides the drawing that she is doing in the park from Oliver and then tears it up, as though it were revealing more of her than she cares to show. Well, why have this around? We're seven minutes into Cat People and have gotten as much to think about as there is in a whole first-class universal horror movie of the same period, such as The Wolfman. Notice, incidentally, how that very phallic spear projects in front of Oliver. Nothing in Cat People, not the script, the production design, the editing, or the direction, is typical for a B-movie of this or any period. How did this remarkable little picture and those classics that followed from Val Luton at RKO come about? For the answer, while well, Irena tells of the legend of the cat people of her village and Roy Webb's beautifully understated chorale plays on the soundtrack, we should start at the beginning with Val Luton himself. Val Luton was born on May 7, 1904 in Yalta, Russia. His mother, Nina Leventon came from a highly educated, very well-placed professional family in Tsarist Russia. His uncle was a journalist, his aunt was the famed Russian actress Alla Nazimova, and Nina herself was a musician and a singer. Not much is known about Luton's father. According to biographer Joel L. Siegel, the marriage between Nina and her husband broke up very quickly and Nina took her two children, Vladimir, later known as Val, and Lucy to Berlin, and then took her family name back and gave it to them. She brought her children to America, and it was here that the Leventon family name was changed to Luton. Nazimova established herself in movies in America during the second decade of this century, and it was with her help that Luton's mother got a job as a reader in the story department of Metro Studios in New York. Lucy was trained as a chemist, and Val began to show ability as a writer, or at least a spinner of tales. The father of an old friend of mine knew Luton during the period in which he attended boarding school and remembered him as extremely bright and inventive, always devising stories. As a teenager, Luton was already working as a reporter for a newspaper in Connecticut, and he later attended Columbia University's School of Journalism. He bounced between newspaper jobs in New York City and managed to make a living as a writer, despite some very unorthodox work habits that didn't always endear him to his editors or publishers. This scene, by the way, tells us a little more about Oliver. He's a nautical designer, and has a healthy, if somewhat superficial, relationship with a group of colleagues that include a woman named Alice. The man with the droll sense of humor is Alan Napier, 
whom most viewers under the age of 40 probably remember best as Alfred the Butler from the Batman TV series. He became a member of the Val Luton Stock Company, as did Kent Smith and Jane Randolph, who plays Alice. The Commodore, as he's referred to, is played by Jack Holt, an RKO contract player and former leading man, who was the father of Tim Holt, RKO's top Western star of the late 1940s, and the lead in Orson Welles's The Magnificent Ambersons and John Huston's The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. It was with Nina Luton's help that Val got his first chance to work in motion pictures, writing publicity copy at MGM under Howard Dietz, the famed lyricist and studio executive, perhaps best known today for the songs That's Entertainment and Dancing in the Dark, in collaboration with Arthur Schwartz. At MGM, he adapted the studio's publicity material into newspaper features and its story material into radio dramas and serializations. He began writing books in the early 1920s, poetry collections, novels, nonfiction historical and technical material. Many, though not all of these novels, were exploitation works, if not dirty in any current sense, then filled with tales of extramarital relations and accounts of the loose morals of men and women, what his aunt Nazimova referred to as hot books. The first of Luton's major books about the Depression, No Bed of Her Own, was a respectable seller, at least overseas, and the screen rights were later bought by Paramount, where it became the basis for the Clark Gable, Carol Lombard vehicle, No Man of Her Own. He began writing novels, short stories, and radio shows, and by the early 1930s was gone from MGM to work freelance as an author. In 1933, Luton was hired by David O. Selznick to adapt the novel Taris Bulba into a screen treatment, and he and his wife Ruth, the two had married in 1929, and daughter Nina, moved out to California. Selznick in those days had just left RKO and was setting up production on his own. David O. Selznick was the first of the second generation of movie moguls. His father, Lewis, had already lost Selznick Pictures to bankruptcy in the 1920s. But despite this family setback, Lewis's two sons, David and Myron, had each impressed their father's better-heeled rivals. Myron became one of Hollywood's most successful and beloved agents, while David rose to become head of production at RKO before setting up shop as an independent producer. He was not a kind man, according to most who worked for him. He could treat his artists with great cruelty, and Alfred Hitchcock specifically patterned the appearance of the Raymond Burr character in Rear Window as a near match for Selznick, as a personal dig at his one-time employer. As an independent producer, he paid relatively little and routinely forced his people to work long hours. We've just come out of a pet store filled with cats, but now we're going to find more cats of a different kind in the next shot. We're going back to Arena's apartment and the cats are multiplying. There's the statue of King John in the foreground on the left. And now, from a different angle, we see a large black cat in the painting in the background. That painting, incidentally, is a reproduction of one by Goya and was chosen at the suggestion of DeWitt Bodine, the screenwriter. He had a particular fascination with it and was gratified to see it used in the movie. Love me, Irena. Mm -hmm. And then, from a different angle, doesn't the shadow of the chair thrown against the wall look like a pair of cat's ears? Decorating this set and lighting it must have been a delight for the art department. One can just imagine being handed the instructions to put as many felines in shape, shadow, and spirit into the picture, all to be shot in 18 days, and the discussions between Luton, Nicholas Muzaraka, and Al Fields in the art department. At some point, someone must have asked, do you think we can work one more cat into the picture? And there was the shadow from that chair. Getting back to Selznick, he did recognize talent and ability, 
and encouraged it, fostering the careers of Alfred Hitchcock and Max Steiner, among others, including Val Luton. Selznick brought Luton fully into the movie business and showed him what quality filmmaking was all about. All of his pictures reflected the best that money, sweat, and obsession could deliver. Luton always credited Selznick with giving him the basis for a sound sense of cinema and its potential. Luton was initially hired by Selznick at a salary of $200 a week to do the Taris Bulba treatment. That treatment, delivered after two months, was never used, but Selznick decided to keep Luton on his staff as his story editor at $100 per week the equivalent to a salary in the late 20th century of perhaps $600 or $700 a week. A comfortable living, especially during the Depression, but not exceptional. One of the many projects that Luton worked on during his eight years with Selznick was to register the titles of public domain novels and other source material as upcoming Selznick productions. The material, which included such works as Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, may have been in the public domain, but an agreement between the studios and major independents meant that once a producer had registered his intention to film a title, no other studio or producer would touch it. Selznick liked covering his bets. The scene in the Yugoslavian restaurant is one of the better parts of the picture. Amid the banter between Doc Carver and Alice, and the Commodore and Alice, and don't the men sound very, forgive the expression, caddy in this scene, we catch a glimpse of the sort of detail and the sort of actress that helped make cat people utterly beguiling to even the least interested film goer in 1942. And there she is, Elizabeth Russell. Val Luton saw a sultry, sinister quality in her appearance that fascinated him, and he cast her in cat people as this mysterious cat woman. She's only on screen for about 35 seconds, but she captivates the viewer and steals the entire scene, even though her only dialogue consists of two words repeated and not even in her own voice. In order to increase the identification between this woman and Irena, they dubbed Simone Simone's voice into Russell's mouth for this scene. Moya sestra. The way this scene is handled, if you look at it closely, it's almost as though the cat woman were approaching a sexual contact. A woman approaches another at her wedding party and calls her sister. The undertone of lesbianism in this scene was intentional, according to screenwriter DeWitt Bodine. In an interview in Fangoria in 1982, he recalled that after Cat People came out, Luton got a lot of letters saying that he was the first filmmaker to make a movie about lesbians and praised him for it. He was very surprised and went to Bodine and asked him if he was aware of this. And Bodine admitted that he thought some people would interpret Russell's scene that way. He told Luton to be proud that he got it past the censors because it was so subtle they couldn't see it. Actually, in Bodine's original draft of the opening sequence in Central Park, this cat woman was in that scene. She was supposed to be sitting, watching Irena and Oliver, and the sketch that Irena drops was to be blown over to her. And she was to have speared it with a parasol, looked at the image, and smiled. Luton had him rewrite it because he asked, what kind of a woman sits around Central Park with a parasol? Elizabeth Russell became one of Luton's favorite actresses and he found roles for her in many of his subsequent movies, most notably as the bitter, threatening Barbara Farron in Curse of the Cat People. The scene at the end of that film, in which she confronts little Ann Carter, standing over the body of Farron's dead mother, is one of the most terrifying in the Luton canon, conveying grief and a murderous rage all churning inside of this woman and threatening to overwhelm the girl. The confrontation scene in Cat People, incidentally, is highly representative of the dualities found in many of Luton's pictures. His stories and scripts often feature characters that are clear opposites of each other, 
or that are different sides of the same coin. The cat woman in Cat People is a counterpart to Irena, what Irena fears becoming if her sexuality is aroused. In The Seventh Victim, Kim Hunter and Jean Brooks play sisters who are opposites, focused on the bright and the dark sides of reality. We're at the wedding night, and Irena, out of fear or neurosis or both, is now trapped, pacing back and forth, almost as though she is in her own cage, pawing at the door like a cat, and hearing the yowling of the panther from the zoo. The movie comes as close to specifying sexuality as the basis for Irena's transformation as it was possible to do in the 1940s. It also benefits from good, understated performances by Simone Simone and Kent Smith in this scene. Time has now passed. Irena and Oliver are together but unhappy, as the zookeeper quickly figures out. The Keeper is a familiar figure from other classic films of the 1940s. Alec Craig, a Scottish actor whom some viewers will remember as one of the organizers of the Grange in The Devil and Daniel Webster, while others will remember him as the sinister spider expert who tries to kill Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in the 1943 Universal Holmes film, The Spider Woman. Revelation. Well, the book's talking about the worst beast of them all. It says, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Like unto a leopard? Yes, ma'am. Like a leopard, but not a leopard. I guess that fits this fella. Yes, it fits him. Craig provides a little biblical basis for Irena's fears and some ecclesiastical background for the legends that she has grown up with. And by the way, that's a nice recreation of New York in the background. Now this is a great dissolve. We see the black leopard in the painting in the light. We'd previously seen it in the dark, and it looks as though it is stalking the bird that Oliver gave Irena. She sees the bird herself, and a dazzling display of acting without words sums up the conflicts that drive her. Simone Simone is really fine here, giving just the right balance of innocence and perhaps madness psychosis or something else to make the scene work. She's suddenly cat-like as she reaches into the cage, both playful and malevolent. And then the human side of her reacts with grief and shame. It's one instance where Roy Webb might have restrained himself in his scoring. Her acting carries everything needed in the scene and the elegiac music overdoes it by about a third. But this was new territory in filmmaking for Luton and everyone else. By this time, one would have expected a definite clue as to whether Irena's fears are justified or not. The model for the horror film up to this point had been the universal horror films, such as The Wolfman, which would have delivered something tangibly monstrous if not the monster itself seen full face on camera, to let the audience know what they're dealing with. But the audience in Cat People is dealing with a lot more, including a dramatically coherent, beautifully layered story. Getting back to Val Luton, he spent eight years working for David O. Selznick and enjoyed the security even if he resented the long hours and other demands put on him by his boss. During this period, among those whose acquaintance he made was John Houseman, the former businessman turned producer, who joined the Selznick organization briefly during 1940-41, after coming out to Hollywood with the Mercury Theater that he headed with Orson Welles. While Welles was off shooting Citizen Kane, Houseman was employed by Selznick to stage a series of plays involving his contracted actors, including Ingrid Bergman. In 1980, I interviewed Hausman, and we discussed Luton. Hausman described him as a cultured, articulate man, utterly unlike most of the people in Hollywood or the executives they worked for. He had a sense of humor and a depth of understanding of literature and psychology that was remarkable, even in those years. They're happy. They make their husbands. Not all of Luton's work was behind the scenes. 
Luton and Jacques Turner, a young expatriate French filmmaker who later went on to make Out of the Past and Curse of the Demon, wrote and staged the storming of the Bastille sequence from Selznick's Tale of Two Cities. Luton recommended that Selznick buy the remake rights to a Swedish film called Intermezzo and bring its young star, Ingrid Bergman, to America. And Luton was responsible for suggesting the sequence in Gone with the Wind of that crane shot of the Atlanta railway station with its thousands of wounded soldiers stretched out before the camera. But Selznick also gave Luton such demeaning tasks as determining the proper length of the intermission in Gone with the Wind by measuring the length of time audiences spent in the bathrooms during the previews. It was at such preview showings, according to Kim Hunter, that Luton once pulled the wool over Selznick's eyes, at least temporarily. He was tired of waiting to collect the response cards that people filled out at previews, so he went into the men's room and very hurriedly filled out dozens of them, devising false names for each. When Hunter was signed by Selznick, and it was time to choose a screen name for her, Selznick said, send her to Val Luton. He's good at making up names. The action in Cat People for the last few minutes has been leading inexorably, event built on event very neatly, to the introduction of the last of the players in our drama, the psychiatrist, Dr. Lewis Judd, portrayed by Tom Conway. The dialogue here isn't too sophisticated. Looking at it today, one gets the sense of an unseen light bulb lighting up above Kent Smith's head. But the presence of a psychiatrist in Cat People and the role given to the psychiatrist in the script is an amazingly sophisticated touch and to some extent betrays Luton's New York background. Psychiatry was a relatively exotic field for most moviegoers in the early 1940s. Not that the science was unknown. Indeed, in 1924, Samuel Goldwyn, who understood the public taste as well as anyone in movies, made a big noise in the press about sailing to Europe to offer $150,000 to Sigmund Freud to author a romantic film script. Freud turned Goldwyn down, incidentally. During the 1930s, psychiatrists were often the objects of ridicule, as in the front page and His Girl Friday, in which the psychiatrist, Dr. Egelhofer, a blustery European type, in the course of conducting tests on a convicted murderer, hands the man a gun and facilitates his escape. Partly, this grew out of the notion of psychiatry as a rich person's diversion. For most of the country, only the wealthy or the truly mentally disabled were perceived as having the need or access to the services of psychiatrists, as in Now Voyager, or, more tellingly, Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. For the great masses, especially outside of New York, psychiatry rated somewhere below podiatry as a commonly used medical specialty. And for many, a valid perception was the psychiatrist as manipulator and villain, as seen in pictures such as The Miracle on 34th Street, or in the 1945 Edgar Ulmer B thriller, Strange Illusion, a sort of modern dress version of Hamlet, in which the psychiatrist, in league with the Claudius figure portrayed by Warren William, has the young hero committed to an institution and convinces all around him that he is suffering from acute paranoia. In fact, Strange Illusion has a double slam against psychiatrists. Not only is the head of the institution falsely imprisoning the hero, but the man that he is in league with, the Claudius figure who murdered the hero's father, is also a child molester with an unsavory interest in the hero's 14-year-old sister. And let us not forget the Mickey Spillane 1951 Mike Hammer debut novel, I, the Jury, in which the murderer turns out to be a lady psychiatrist. This is only the stuff of pulp fiction, but pulp fiction doesn't appear out of the ether. Its creators must have an awareness of the public's perceptions and sensibilities on a multitude of subjects. So when Oliver, 
a thoroughly middle-class, middle-brow citizen, suggests psychiatry as a solution to Irena's problem, it is a completely unexpected touch in a 1942 motion picture supposedly aimed at the masses. Just one of those elements of Luton's movies that makes them unique. I'm sorry, Irena. I'm sure neither The psychiatrist here turns out to have his own designs on his patient. But in a later movie, The Seventh Victim, Val Luton was to bring Tom Conway's Dr. Judd back, even though he is killed in Cat People, call it poetic license, in a much more benevolent role. Psychiatry also provides the necessary degree of rational explanation required of horror movies in the 1940s as opposed to the 1930s. Just as Universal Pictures could no longer send Flash Gordon to other planets in single-stage spaceships tinkered together by Dr. Zarkov after 1940, so the existence of monsters required certain concessions to the rational and to realities that people understood. This scene is a nice touch, having Irena called by the leopard and turn up to pace before its cage in time with the cat, as though she too were caged and awaiting release. In any case, at Universal Pictures in the 1940s, the revived Count Dracula, as portrayed by John Carradine, was found to be suffering from a blood disorder. The lycanthropy that turned Lawrence Talbot into a werewolf came not from a gypsy curse, as in the first Wolfman movie, but from pressure on the brain, the result of the infected bite from another werewolf. And if the Frankenstein monster was a killer because it had the brain of a murderer, the solution was to replace the brain with another, whether it came from a stricken scientist, the hunchbacked Igor, or, as was the intention in the monster's final outing for Universal, Lou Costello, probably the scariest of all prospects. Luton simply turned to the psychological for his brush with reality. We never grow. In 1942, Val Luton was consciously looking for an opportunity to leave Selznick, one that would pay more and offer him a greater challenge. And that opportunity came at the studio where, eight years before, Selznick had been in charge. RKO Radio Pictures was coming off one of the most productive and frustrating periods in its entire history. For the previous two years, under President George Schaefer, the studio had followed an ambitious production program, built in part around a group of movies by a new young producer-director from New York named Orson Welles. Citizen Kane and the Magnificent Ambersons had attracted a great deal of attention, but Kane had failed to make a profit despite impressive reviews and a fair amount of controversy over its subject matter. And Ambersons had proved to be unreleasable as prepared by Wells in its 140-minute preview version. RKO had other ambitious films in production that same year outside of the Wells orbit, but even those were beset by problems. The best of them, The Devil and Daniel Webster, lost money the result of three weeks of reshooting caused by the injury to one of its key players, Thomas Mitchell, during the final two weeks of work. There were a few bright spots, such as The Devil and Miss Jones, starring Gene Arthur and Charles Coburn, but from August of 1941 onward, RKO lost money in every month of its operations. By the time the smoke cleared in mid-1942, Orson Welles was off the lot Ambersons was cut to 90 minutes, and Schaefer was on his way out, fired in June of 1942. In March of 1942, amid all of this chaos, a new chief of production had been brought in, Charles Kerner, the head of RKO's theater division. He had a difficult job to do, to come up with a production schedule that would generate cash for the studio in a hurry, and to cut its losses in other areas. Kerner took a look at Universal Pictures, a studio that had been in financial straits even worse than RKO's only a couple of years earlier, and had climbed out of them with the help of a revival of its horror films. Universal had something of a trademark on horror movies ever since the 1930s, 
But it was Kerner's idea that perhaps there was room for a cycle of good, inexpensive horror films from another source. Toward that end, in the spring of 1942, Kerner met Val Luton and offered him a spot on the studio payroll as a producer. The caveat was that he would head a unit doing B-horror movies, produced on strictly controlled budgets and using titles that had been tested by RKO's marketing department. If he stuck to those provisions, Luton was promised, he would have a free hand and he would have the coveted post of producer. The funny thing was that Val Luton didn't want to make horror movies and never had an inkling of doing them. So the story goes, Luton was pointed out to Kerner at a party. When asked what Luton wrote, the person doing the introduction said that Luton wrote, quote, horrible stories, unquote, referring to the pulp fiction that he'd done during the 1920s and 1930s. Kerner mistook horrible stories for horror stories, and that was how the offer came to Luton. And that was how Val Luton became known as the master of horror at RKO. Irena is back at the zoo now, and this scene is doubly important because we're being primed here. For one of the neatest shock sequences in the picture and of the entire 1940s. And if you look at this shot, reintroducing Dr. Judd, isn't he observing Irena in much the same way that she was observing the leopard in the cage at the opening of the picture? With a maximum of $150,000 to spend, Luton immediately reasoned that the only possible way he could make a successful horror movie was to be twice as clever and three times as subtle as Universal. He couldn't and didn't want to make horror movies in the manner of Universal's pictures, but if he was going to make horror movies at all, he would do them with a difference. Universal's movies showed their monsters. He couldn't afford to show his monsters because he could scarcely afford to show monsters at all. Monsters involved time, makeup, and the budgets for both. He had 18 days to shoot in, and if it was going to work, it would work because of the writing, the directing, and the acting. Luton himself was a writer, but writing and producing for the screen was a tall order his first time out on a low budget. Actually, he did the final drafts of each screenplay for every one of his films at RKO except for Isle of the Dead, which was extensively rewritten after pre-production was well underway. But only once, very late in his career, did he accept screenwriting credit because he was forced to on Bedlam. And even there, he used his old Pulp Fiction pseudonym, Carlos Keith. According to Luton's daughter, Nina, as attributed by Joel Siegel, he was reluctant to assign himself co-author's credit, even though the rules governing such matters at the time would have permitted it, because the assumption would have been that he had done the rewrite solely to get the credit. For him, it was a no-win situation. Luton chose as his screenwriter DeWitt Bodine, an author and playwright with whom he was acquainted both personally and professionally. For his director, he chose Turner, who had been in the United States for eight years without directing a proper feature film after having completed four full-length pictures in France. RKO gave Luton his first title, Cat People, rather ironic because Luton had an almost primitive, atavistic fear of cats. And it was Luton's original intention to make a film adaptation of an Algernon Blackwood story called Ancient Sorceries, and retitle it Cat People. But according to Bodine, partway through the negotiations for the screen rights, Luton suddenly changed his mind and decided to devise an original story set in contemporary New York City. The change was dictated in all probability by the fact that ancient stories would have required a period European setting, and he didn't want to get too ambitious his first time out. According to Siegel, Turner also argued for the contemporary domestic setting based on the idea that for audiences to experience terror, especially on the suggested level that Luton intended to work, 
they would respond better to a story involving characters and a period and setting with which they could easily identify. In that regard, it's important to note that Luton's record with horror films set in contemporary times was far more impressive than his record with period and costume films. Cat People, I Walked with a Zombie, The Ghost Ship, Curse of the Cat People, and The Seventh Victim can all be considered unqualified successes. And I Walked with a Zombie and The Seventh Victim are downright mesmerizing. Of Luton's two costume dramas, The Body Snatcher is a dazzling cinematic conjuring trick. But Bedlam is a more scattershot, less focused picture, in which the costumes and period detail tend to dilute the impact of the horror material. One small question does come up in this scene. Where was John Paul Jones, the office cat, when Oliver had his kitten at the office? Getting back to the origins of cat people, Luton's budget didn't allow for much ambition in the way of casting. He spotted his leading man, Kent Smith, on the RKO lot, where he had been for almost a year after coming from Broadway, doing precious little. Luton believed that the public wanted essentially nice, innocent, fresh-faced leads. And in Smith, he found both the freshness, the talent, and the sincerity that he was looking for. Smith was born in 1907 in New York City and was educated at Exeter and at Harvard. A New Englander, he founded a stock company in Massachusetts and later made his way to Broadway, where he distinguished himself in Shakespearean roles, most notably in Anthony and Cleopatra working alongside Catherine Cornell. Smith made his first trip to Hollywood in the late 1930s, but it wasn't until he came to RKO in 1942 that he got a crack at good roles and good pictures. He was in some interesting movies, including Hitler's Children and the genre noir wartime drama This Land is Mine, but Cat People was his best picture. He could be a formidable talent when turned loose in the right part. His performance is one of the best things in The Fountainhead, in the role of Peter Keating, the architect who survives more on personal charm than any inventiveness as an architect. Oh, here's a cute little in-joke, one you really don't see coming, because the script has been playing it pretty straight for the last few minutes. You cold? A cat just walked over my grave. The stalking scene gets rolling here on a set that is a surprisingly good recreation of the Central Park transverse. This is the first of the movie's shock sequences. Luton used to say that for $150,000, he and his production team could deliver three good chills, a brutal murder, and a happy ending. The park sequence relies almost entirely on sound to achieve its sense of menace. The tapping of Alice's and Irena's heels on the pavement as they walk, and the echoes along the channel of the walls of the transverse Alice's realization that there is a second set of heels following her, and then the disappearance of that second set of heels, which is even more ominous. Luton and Turner had the RKO sound department work overtime on Cat People in terms of working out the precise levels needed to achieve just the right effect of the echoes and the volume level needed to bring this scene to its conclusion the shot becomes more claustrophobic as Alice turns back to look behind her. We now see less around her as she faces the camera and continues walking. The shot is much tighter and we begin to expect something to happen, maybe, and then some activity starts on the soundtrack. Come on, sister. Are you riding with me or ain't you? Luton and Turner were very proud of the fact that people seeing cat people in theaters actually thought that they saw something in this scene the shadow of a cat or something about to pounce on Jane Randolph. In point of fact, there was nothing, only the audio track 
and the sudden appearance of the bus from the right side of the screen. In movie theaters, that sequence is even more effective than it seems here. The animals, even our friend the leopard, have seen something like a leopard, but not a leopard. And the keeper has found part of its trail. The return to Irena is handled very quietly and very eerily. We were primed for that shock sequence in the park by the earlier scene, at 36 minutes and 30 seconds into the picture, eight minutes earlier, actually, when Irena is walking beside the leopard cage and the film gives special emphasis to the leopard's snarl. The snarl is then mimicked by the sound of the bus coming in out of shot and the burst of air from its hydraulic system as its doors open. This scene was so effective that Luton later referred to shock scenes such as this in his movies as buses. In Luton's third film, The Leopard Man, there is a scene that recalls this one in the park, but in a much crueler and more savage manner. A young girl, forced out of her home at night despite her fear of the dark by her mother to get some food, is walking through the woods after having finally gotten the food. There are a couple of generic buses, wind-blowing bushes, sagebrush, and then, suddenly, there is a real leopard watching her and she starts to run. In that movie, which neither Luton nor Turner considered a success, the girl runs and does make it to her door. But her mother has decided to teach her a lesson for being late by locking her out. And by the time the woman realizes that there is something really out there after her daughter and is struggling to unlock the door to her daughter's screams, it is too late. The screams stop, the snarling stops, and a pool of blood begins to form at the bottom of the door from the other side. The cat illusions in the movie the claws that form the legs of the tub in which Irena is trying to cleanse herself now seem cruel rather than funny. One of the other reasons that Luton's movies touch so many buttons in viewers is that it is so easy to identify with his supposed villains. In fact, Cat People has no villains, only victims, of which Irena is the one that resonates the deepest emotionally. Oliver is such a stiff, that except for the scene in which he bears his soul and his misery to Alice, it is difficult to imagine anyone identifying terribly much with him. And Alice is such a new figure in films, the new kind of other woman, she says, the kind of independent, self-motivated woman who came to the fore during World War II, that one can't imagine too many audience members identifying with her, easily at least. As demonstrated by this brief dream sequence, we see more of Irena's life and her emotional life than we do of any other character in this picture. In The Seventh Victim, we find out almost more than we want to know about Jacqueline, the errant devil worshipper. In I Walked with a Zombie, the entire Holland family and all of its misery is laid bare before us. And in Bedlam and The Body Snatcher, we learn that there are all too human and understandable reasons behind the cruelties and barbarities committed by Boris Karloff's characters in both pictures. He's almost too easy to identify with. Simone Simone makes an extremely sympathetic leading lady. Luton spotted her in another RKO-made feature, The Devil and Daniel Webster. Simone had already been through Hollywood once, in a failed effort at Fox in the mid-1930s after a career in French films and stage reviews that had made her a star in her own country. Her first time in Hollywood was plagued by misunderstandings with the studio and an injury suffered when they insisted that she take a part that required her to ride a horse. Her fondest memories of her Hollywood films of the 1930s were of Herbert Marshall, with whom she co-starred in Girls' Dormitory in 1936. She described him as a kind and wonderful man, which was more than she could say for her director, Irving Cummings. And later on, there was a minor scandal of sorts 
when a gold key to her mansion in Hollywood was discovered among the effects of the late George Gershwin in 1938. She says that she and Gershwin were only friends and played tennis together. But for decades afterward, many of those close to the composer claimed that he wrote Love Walked In with Simone Simone in mind. She returned to France and was then discovered by Jean Renoir, who gave her the lead role in his movie The Human Beast. That, in turn, led to her discovery by William Dieterle and the part of the demon woman in The Devil and Daniel Webster. After finishing that movie in the summer of 1941, Simone went on the road, singing in variety shows. It was there that Luton looked her up, offered her the same money she was making on stage, $2,000 a week for three weeks' work in Cat People. She agreed after reading the script, which she loved, although she says she didn't see the script or story as particularly sexual in orientation, one reason that she resented the Paul Schrader remake. The pool sequence is the most famous scene in Cat People, and this was the conception of DeWitt Bodine based on an experience that he'd had as a child. Growing up in Fresno, California, he'd been playing near his family's pool after dark, swinging on a rope. He got dizzy and fell into the water and was unable to balance as he thrashed about helplessly and nearly drowned. The pool was lighted, but there was nothing but darkness around it, and he was alone. At Luton's insistence, the RKO sound crew under John Cass spent two days at an indoor swimming pool at the Royal Palms Hotel in Los Angeles, recording reverberation effects in preparation for the pool scene. They also spent a day at a lion farm recording and studying the sounds of the big cats. Both were expenditures that the studio's accounting department later objected to. But despite these protests, the movie finally came in at $135,000, $6,000 under budget. There are only shadows in this sequence, but it is marvelously effective, coupling Alice's screams, the rippling of the water, and its shadows on the ceiling, and the growls into a palpable terror. In a movie theater projected on a big screen in which those ripples and the echoes are totally enveloping, the film was at least twice as effective as it seems viewed at home. The reappearance of Simone Simone as Arena, talking quietly and calmly, caps the scene, only now she is menacing as well as sympathetic. In her earlier pursuit of Alice, there was an element of rage and irrationality. But in this scene, we get a glimpse of her character in a more calculatedly murderous frame of mind. So don't go, I'm coming right out. Simone Simone loved the part of Irena, although, as I said, she did not see the film or the part as being focused especially on sexuality. She also had no notion of the fact that Cat People was a B-movie although it was obvious that they were working very hard and very fast. Shooting was completed in exactly three six-day work weeks, and she remembers that she had nobody to do her makeup. She may have had someone to help her with her costumes. Even at that time, although she didn't really get much of a chance to know her fellow actors or her director, Jacques Tourneur, she had a sense that they had created something special and unusual. Release schedules being what they were, Luton and Turner finished two more pictures together before the public ever saw Cat People. It was then, after its release, that word began filtering back from the front office, give us more like Cat People. This modest little B picture, which cost perhaps one-tenth what the magnificent Ambersons had cost to make, was returning unexpected tens of thousands of dollars every month. The economics of B pictures played a vital role in Cat People's success, not only in terms of earnings, but art. B pictures were designed to fill the sudden demand for second features, which had become a popular way to induce audiences into theaters during the Depression. The producers of B pictures didn't receive a percentage of the box office receipts, as was the case with main features. Rather, the films were booked for a flat fee per theater, per play date. The secret was to get the pictures booked into as many theaters as possible. B-movies were sold by genre, 
horror, western, action, exploitation, depending on a theater's clientele. And because they were booked for flat fees, their costs had to be carefully contained if they were to turn a profit. They usually had a lean look, and leanness is a virtue of all of Luton's movies. He didn't have the luxury of two-hour or even 90-minute running times, and his movies benefited from this economy of design and storytelling. RKO calculated that a horror movie could return perhaps $600,000, given the number of theaters that would book such a picture. What happened with Cat People was that, rather than filling in the bottom of a program, it became the major attraction in theaters where it ran, as word of mouth spread. It was booked heavily and rebooked. Profits were never announced on such pictures, but Cat People appears to have earned between one and two million dollars in its first two years of release, and may have returned as much as four million dollars over the past 51 years. Tom Conway playing Dr. Judd was a most interesting performer and a key member of the Luton Stock Company in his two best pictures, I Walked With a Zombie and The Seventh Victim. In fact, as with Simone Simone, Kent Smith, and so many others in the cast of Luton's pictures, his association with the producer marked the artistic high point of his career. He was the older brother of George Sanders, born Thomas Charles Sanders in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1904 to an English couple. He was educated at Brighton College, but never took well to the formalities of education or any other setting. According to one account, he was expelled from college for threatening a faculty member with a gun. He went to South Africa, where he engaged in a number of speculative ventures with mixed results before returning to England in the mid-1920s. Conway, who changed his name to prevent confusion with his brother, after losing a bet as to which one of them would change their name, appears to have reinvented his background several times during his life. According to some accounts, it was his brother George who gave him the idea of becoming an actor. On another occasion, he claimed to have been discovered by accident when he turned up backstage at an audition and found himself cast in the stage thriller Number 17, a 1920s play that was filmed by Hitchcock in 1932. In any case, Conway worked on the British stage during the 1930s and went to Hollywood in 1940. He worked for a time as a contract player for MGM, playing glib, well-spoken ladies' men. In 1942, he rose to stardom under very unusual circumstances, rather over his brother's dead body, on screen that is. George Sanders, who was a star at the time, normally specializing in villainous roles, had begun a series of low-budget mysteries at RKO based on the Michael Arlen character, The Falcon, a sort of low-rent version of Leslie Charteris's The Saint, about a roguish hero not above seeking personal vengeance and reward in the course of doing his good deeds. But Sanders had tired of the role and suggested a solution to replacing him. His brother Tom was cast as the Falcon's brother, Tom, in the movie The Falcon's Brother. In it, the original Falcon, played by Sanders, is wounded by Nazi agents, and his brother, played by Conway, steps in. Sanders' hero sacrifices himself to save the victim of an assassination attempt, and Conway's character replaced him for a four-year run in the role of the Falcon, the people I've spoken to who knew them both have spoken well of Conway. Val Luton used to refer to Tom Conway as, quote, the nice Sanders, unquote, clearly referring to the fact that Conway was a much more agreeable personality than his brother. Alas for Conway, he was unable to sustain his career despite appearing in over 200 movies. After the Falcon series ended in the mid-1940s, he did get good parts, but not often in good pictures. Rather typically, he played the roguish villain in One Touch of Venus, starring Robert Walker and Ava Gardner, and did very well in it. But the movie itself was a failure. During this same period, his brother was playing King Charles in the hit 20th century Fox film Forever Amber. This is a very nice scene late in the picture. 
Irena may be acting like an insane person, but she's also acting like a cat aroused by anger, her breath puffing, and the touch with the claws at the end of this scene is wonderfully nasty. Getting back to Conway, in the early 1950s, while his brother was playing major roles such as Sir Brian de Bois Gilbert in Ivanhoe, or the sinister newspaper executive in the Fritz Lang thriller While the City Sleeps, Conway was making a series of low-budget, falcon-type mysteries in England that were barely seen in America. And by the end of the decade, he was doing guest spots on shows like Rawhide and working in ultra-low-budget features such as the Saturday afternoon kids classic, The Atomic Submarine. A drinking problem didn't help. By 1965, Conway was destitute, living on public assistance. A series of newspaper articles publicized his plight, and he began working his way back towards solvency. But medical problems caught up with him, and he died in 1967. Conway and his brother didn't speak during the final years of his life, a result of some sort of argument between them that was never resolved. The music for Cat People, particularly Irena's theme, which we're hearing as an orchestral piece on a record in her and Oliver's apartment, had an interesting genesis. A picture like Cat People would normally have had pre-existing soundtrack music tracked into it to keep the cost down. Luton, however, wanted a distinctive signature tune that Arena would sing or hum, very much like the fragment from Pierre Gint that is used so effectively in Fritz Lang's M. No established classical piece was forthcoming, despite music department head Roy Webb's attending story conferences to get a feel for the score that Luton wanted. Irena's theme evidently came to Luton and Webb on the set of Cat People when Luton heard Simone Simone sing an old French lullaby. The rest of the score followed in short order, and Webb wrote full original scores for all of Luton's subsequent RKO films. Everything in Cat People seemed to fall into place, although there was a rough point very early on when one RKO executive insisted that Jacques Turner be fired. The man had seen the first three days of rushes on the film and had disliked them and was adamant. Apparently, Turner had too much of a continental touch to his work. It was too subtle for a studio whose previous B pictures had been action thrillers and westerns. Luton was able to get Turner a reprieve until Charles Kerner himself looked at the material that had been shot. Kerner overruled his own management representative, and the movie went forward with minimal interference, until the previews and this scene in the office. It had been Luton's and Turner's intention to make a horror movie that didn't show anything that was inherently terrifying. Everything was to be suggestive. Luton correctly reasoned that nothing he could show, especially on his budget, would be as frightening as what the audience could imagine and that the audience's ability to imagine the menace and terror would be destroyed if an overt horror shot were seen in the film. Audiences at the previews liked the movie, but Kerner and the other executives felt that it needed something tangible. It had to deliver a shot of Arena in her feline form, even if it was only a leopard. Jacques Turner went back into the studio for one day shooting, with the Black Leopard Dynamite and his trainer, Mel Kuntz, and added a group of shots of the leopard stalking Oliver and Alice around the office. Fortunately, the movie was saved by Turner's ability to do the shots in almost complete darkness and editor Mark Robson's abilities in the cutting room. Robson, who later became a director in Luton's horror film unit, was the largely unsung hero in the Val Luton saga. Fans through the years focus on the producer, the director, and the stars in their admiration, but there wasn't much notice paid to the tightness of the editing. Watch these shots, however, as Robson puts in just enough leopard to make the executives happy, but so little of the leopard in the clear that it could actually be a supernatural creature.
Leave us, Raina. In the name of God, leave us in peace. This scene is the most controversial in the picture for many viewers today. The use of the T-square as a cross is regarded as a cop-out to some who see it as a throwback to the sort of trick that the hero in a universal horror film might use against some menace, say, a vampire. The lighting of this scene, incidentally, is amazing. The indirect glare of the design tables provides the only illumination. But getting back to the cross and Oliver's use of it, the scene really works on a dramatic level. Up to this point in the picture, Oliver has been shown to be a logical, down-to-earth, modern American male, very much the opposite of Irena. He is as unimaginative and invulnerable to irrational fear as Irena is too imaginative for her own good and very much ruled by irrationality. When he picks up the cross, as it were, the irony is that for the first and only time in the picture, he is acting as though he takes Irena's beliefs and her picture of the world and reality seriously. Earlier in the picture, he belittles and dismisses her focus on the old world and on her village and the supposed curse on her. He doesn't even take the notion of God seriously and never mentions the deity. Now, in a moment of crisis, he calls up the name of God and a symbol of purification. He has at last come to understand Irena and more to the point, the fear that drives her. He's become a believer, faced with this supernatural threat. As someone once said, there are no atheists in foxholes. You'd better leave then, she may be on her way back now. But she is dangerous, Dr. Judd, I warn you. The doctor, on the other hand, never does believe Irena until it is too late. If Oliver has ignored her fears, the doctor abuses them. Talking about the picture in 1994, Simone Simone had an interesting slant on this scene. Her idea is that Irena is not sexually aroused and transformed into the supernatural feline, but that her rage is aroused by this man who chooses to violate their relationship by kissing and embracing her, a direct affront to her fear that she neither asks for nor needs. The one scene that didn't work as written was this one, which concludes with Irena's transformation. Having her back away from the camera and Tom Conway recoil in horror at what is happening failed to convey what was supposed to be happening, and special effects expert Linwood Dunn had to make Simone Simone appear to darken on screen. He accomplished this with masking and density manipulation after the scene was shot. Oliver may be jeopardized by his innocence, but the doctor dies because of his experience, beyond which he cannot see. Luton's heroes and heroines generally have similar qualities. They are all relentlessly good-natured, to the point where their discovery of the horror that lurks behind the plots is a passage from innocence to experience. But they're also flawed by that innocence and make terrible mistakes because of it. Apart from Oliver and Cat People, Francis D. as the nurse in Luton's I Walked with a Zombie meddles in the affairs of the Caribbean island where she is taking care of her patient and finds herself in the midst of a voodoo ceremony. Russell Wade's naive third officer in the ghost ship nearly gets himself killed at the hands of his dangerously unstable captain. And Anna Lee's inquisitive heroine in Bedlam, whose concern for the asylum's afflicted initially threatens her well-being and makes life worse for the inmates. And perhaps the greatest innocent of them all in a Luton movie is Kim Hunter in The Seventh Victim, who does her rapid growing up from innocence to experience amid a cult of devil worshippers living in Greenwich Village. By contrast, like the doctor and cat people, Edmund Glover's radio operator in The Ghost Ship 
dies precisely because his experience tells him to deny what, so he believes, cannot be true, that the captain is a homicidal maniac who has already killed one member of the crew. Those heroes and heroines were, I believe, responsible for much of the popularity of Luton's movies during the time that they were made. Val Luton's movies were produced in the middle of World War II, a time when audiences were taking stock of themselves and their lives against much larger events. They could identify with the relentlessly ordinary heroes and heroines of his pictures and their struggles to come to grips with these forces. We've come full circle in our film, back to the place where it began, only now Irena, not the feline in her drawing, is the cat impaled on a sword. A sword wielded, I might add, by a would-be lover. And here, we close the circle of the film with a symbolic visual unification of sorts. Irena's two sides, human and feline, united in death. The movie is surprisingly frank about sexual function and dysfunction. Cat People was really the first Hollywood film to tie the physical transformation of an afflicted character into the sexual act itself, or the act of being attracted to another human being. In that regard, Irena is a tragic figure that audiences could very much relate to, especially in a period in which people overall felt much more ambivalence about sexual feelings. She's merely expressing as a severe psychosis a conflict that audiences felt about their own sexuality during this era. When Paul Schrader did his remake of Cat People in the early 1980s, he made a necessary but unfortunate change. The story was made literal. Simone Simone said in an interview in March of 1994, that she saw the Schrader movie in Deauville and was taken aback by it. She felt badly for Val Luton, DeWitt Bodine, Jacques Turner, Kent Smith, and the rest of the cast and crew because all of the work that they had done over a frantic 18 days during the summer of 1942 to weave this very delicate spell had been undone. Cat People made Val Luton's name, but in many ways it also doomed him. He was established as a horror producer, which was something he didn't want to be. And he was locked into being a B-movie producer, which he also didn't want to be. Unfortunately, his non-fantasy films, such as the World War II allegory Mademoiselle Fifi and the topical delinquency drama Youth Runs Wild, were failures. And then, when Charles Kerner died very suddenly of leukemia in 1946, he saw his career at RKO at an end. Ironically, much of the talent that he discovered fared much better. Jacques Turner, for example, moved on to much bigger pictures by 1944, and in 1947 directed what was probably the best film noir that RKO ever produced, Out of the Past. Simone Simone really sacrificed her American career because of her loyalty to Luton. Her agent warned her that if she did one more B picture, she would never get to do A features. And then Luton needed her for Curse of the Cat People. She couldn't turn him down. It was the role of a lifetime that he had given her, and she did the picture, and her career in America was basically over. She returned to France after 1946, and contented herself with appearing in films in Europe. By contrast with her, Robert Wise and Mark Robson, from the production side of things, became major producer-directors. Somehow, however, despite the fact that they had set up a production company of their own in the early 50s, they could not bring Luton aboard. The timing was just not right in his career. Val Luton died very suddenly in 1951. 
and the decades afterward, his reputation only grew. Strangely enough, in the 1960s, the picture of his that seemed to get the most attention was Curse of the Cat People, which was not a horror film at all. I suspect now that the movie's story about a child alienated from her parents because of her imagination struck a responsive chord in many young people during that decade. I also wonder sometimes if it wasn't a statement about Luton's own childhood. Apparently, when he was spending time with his aunt Nazimova, she didn't always appreciate his imagination, or his tales, or his ability as a writer. It's certainly his most poetic and lyrical film, and in many respects, along with The Seventh Victim, might be his most personal picture. Luton left RKO after 1946 and tried to put together production deals with other studios. He went to Paramount and then to Universal, but he found, much to his dismay, that as a producer of A features, he was allowed much less freedom than he had been permitted in his little corner at RKO, working on those little B pictures that didn't involve much money and no one was too concerned about. His later films didn't have any of the personal touches of his RKO classics. None of the atmosphere, none of the poetry, and none of the lyricism that made Cat People a classic over 50 years after its release. I'd like to thank you for joining me on this tour through Cat People and through the career of Val Luton. I'd also like to thank the Museum of Modern Art and the Performing Arts Library at Lincoln Center for their assistance in assembling this track, and Bill Longan of SF Rush Video for providing the trailers that we're looking at. And most of all, I'd like to thank Simone Simone and Kim Hunter for their time and cooperation and their recollections of Val Luton.